الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد وبعد I'd like to thank all of the people that have come today and I also want to thank the organizers who first brought it to my attention that they wanted me to come and visit and to address you all because what I'm going to say today is not something that's never been said, but it is the first time that it has been collected and put together in this way. I want for you to go away from this gathering today, not just with a greater knowledge of what's going on in the world, but I want you to go away after today's presentation with solutions. People that know me know that I don't like to give a presentation or any type of knowledge and not give solutions at the end. One, two, three, one, two, three, or I think it's a good idea if you did this, this would be a good idea if you did this. The reason for this I'll mention very briefly is this. Number one, if I just give you information raw, without any solutions to what you're supposed to do about it. That's irresponsible on my part because I've not helped you to deal with this information in a way in which you can actually do something about this information. That's irresponsible. The second reason is if I have given you this information and I haven't given you solutions in the end, I have entertained you, but I've not given you anything to take away that educates you. And I'm not in the business of merely entertaining people without giving them something to take away because that wastes people's time. 90% of everything that you'll find on internet or television is entertainment. There's enough of that. Number three is if I give you this information without anything to take away, I have left you ill-equipped to go back into the world, which again is my fault. And I don't want to bear the responsibility of having people be ill-prepared. So starting off from the beginning, looking at this picture of the houses here, you can see that this is a sort of a collection of houses from San Francisco. And San Francisco has these beautiful houses and people work hard, very, very hard. And once they get this house, that's it. They're just mowing their lawn, living their lives. They're not worried about anything else that happens around them. I have my house, I have my family, I have my business, and that's it. But that's not the right way to be. Just here. Okay, just here? Okay. So that's not the right way to be. So people are busying themselves when in reality they shouldn't be. The next one. In truth, you should understand that this is an age of deception. And I've used this particular slide because if you look, it's a wolf hiding behind the mask of a sheep. This is an age of deception an age in which people in their normal everyday lives are led astray because although they can read and write, they cannot put the pieces together to understand that the world that is around them is closing in. Right. The tribulation of the end times has four topics that I've been asked to discuss where I've grouped everything under. One is the proliferation of sects among the Muslims, which has always been there, but in the last three years has become much more pronounced. The second is social system changes. There are transformations happening in our society that have now accelerated. They were present, but they've accelerated, particularly in this country where it takes longer to pass legislation. They have now increased their efforts and redoubled their 
uh, activities to put through new things that will transform the society in a way in which we had no inkling that would ever happen. Number three is Earth's function. There are transformations happening on this planet that are unprecedented. And sometimes when people say this, they'll say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me give you one example before I go to the fourth point. When I took geology, and I also had to study the Earth's weather, the highest tornado was a factor 10. And when we asked what a factor 10 was, they said, this is theory. This is theory. They said this tornado would probably be a mile around. And I said, well, then what you classify, what name would you give? Because all these tornadoes and hurricanes have names. They said, we would call that the wrath of God. Two years ago, I sat in front of my computer dumbfounded because I'm watching on the news in the southeast of the United States a mile around tornado. They've had to rewrite all of the books that deal with this matter. There was a seven mile tornado a year ago, seven miles around. So this is something that has not happened before. I'm not saying this merely for being salacious or anything like this. This is something that hasn't happened before. The fourth point is the end of currency. I want you to understand that what we know as currency today is going away. The coins that we have in our pockets, the bills that we have in our hands, the promissory notes that are being given to us and being told that is money are not money and they are going away. And it's a systematic process which I want to show you why and then how you can also fortify yourself. Now, with regard to proliferation of sex, I want to give a number of presentations. One is I'm quoting a hadith that has been given in which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that, and it's the famous hadith that we've, most of us have ran across, the ummah splitting into 73 sects, all in the fire except for one. And he mentions that that one is upon what I and my companions are upon. It's a famous hadith, Ibn Majah, Nasa'i, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi. It's in all the Sunan collections. It's in the Musnad. This is a famous hadith. Now let's try to bring it up to date. This hadith is another famous hadith. I've put it here in Arabic. Now let's go to the English. The famous hadith in English is from Hudayfa al-Yaman in which he said to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that we were in ignorance and in wrong. And then Islam, this good came. Will there be evil after it? The, resp the response he received was yes. And he said, will there be some good that will come after that? The response he received was yes, but it will be tainted. Now after that dialogue, he then asks, to describe the people that will be coming in the end. And he said, they have our complexion, meaning these people were Arabs. So they have our complexion. They speak our language, which is Arabic. So the companion that he's speaking to is an Arab. And he's saying they have our complexion. These are Arabs and they speak Arabic. So a lot of what's happening in South Asia is a footnote or an addendum to what's going on in the Muslim heartland countries, the core of which I'm talking about being the Arab countries. Much of the tribulation that you're seeing is going to come. So for a second, let's forget about what we know about the sectarianism that we see today. The Mu'tazila, the first wave of Mu'tazila were Arabs. The first wave of Khawarij were Arabs. The first wave of Murji'a were Arabs. The, most of the 72 sects that came, the vast majority of them, the wave of them, were Arabs. And then the other sects that came later fed off of that. So this is something that we're being told. Now I want to look at one particular sect, which is that of the Khawarij. Because they appear, as in the Hadith and Abu Dawood, every 100 years. I'm going to show you one family tree of their theology, just to make you understand what's going on today. When the first wave of them came 
and they were defeated by the Ottomans. All of them, because of rape, murder, and looting, were executed with the exception of a small handful, which said that they had repented and they would no longer carry this out. One of them was Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan, who was carried to Egypt. He influenced the movements of Egypt, which were many in number. He influenced a lot of different people. You can carry forward. Now, one of the people that he led to forming, or one of the groups that he led to forming, was one known as Ikhwanul Muslimin. Ikhwanul Muslimin in its original form was brought together by a man named Hassan al-Banna, who was a teacher, a Qur'an teacher. But he was assassinated in the early part of the 20th century. Those that came after him were those who in the second incarnation of the Brotherhood, which is known as the Brotherhood. The second incarnation of the Brotherhood was far more violent and took things to a different place than Hassan al-Banna had ever thought of. If you want evidence on this, if you can access the Arabic books, go to all of Hassan al-Banna's books, which are very small. They're only collected in a small set, his Rasail. And then read all of those, which are mainly, you should increase in prayer. You should increase in good deeds. You should care about your neighbor and your local man. You should make sure to look after those who are weak and to always oppose those who are strong and abuse their authority. And then look at those who came immediately after. And you can see the transformation is not just militant, it's also far more violent. Now, when you look at this family tree, in the second incarnation, if you go before this, just before, right, it split into three sections. One in Egypt, one in Palestine, and one in Algeria. Fis was the mother group of Algeria, the mother group of, of the Ikhwan, the Brotherhood in Algeria. They won the elections in Algeria. And the dispute that happened between them and the government <coughs> led to the formation of another group, Jama'at al islami al-Musallaha, the armed Islamic group, which in English we know of as the GIA. And that is still plaguing Algeria today. The beheadings, the mutilations, all these other things, this tribulation is still beheading them. And out of the GIA came Jamaat al Salafiyya al Dawah wal Qital, the Salafi group for fighting and propagation. In Egypt, out of the second incarnation and third incarnation of the Ikhwan came Jamaat al Jihad. Jamaat al Jihad was founded by Ayman al Zawahiri, and Ayman al Zawahiri was the spiritual advisor and head to Osama bin Laden. With regards to Palestine, that led to the founding in 1987 of Hamas, which then split into five other groups. And it just began subdividing, subdividing, subdividing. Now I'm coming to a point. Let's go to the next slide. It, it makes it to the United States, the Ikhwan. The main organizations in the United States were also founded by Brotherhood Movement members. Every single Muslim Student Association campus that I went to, I found a copy of Sayyid Qutb's Milestones, the leader of the second incarnation of the Brotherhood. Everywhere I went, I found that book. I found the signs of the Brotherhood. And when you go to those masjids, or whether they were the South Asian masjids that had been responsible for ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, it was there too. And this tiny group that started off has splintered and exploded into all these different, almost like watching sort of a, a germ cell subdivide. And it's everywhere from that original mother group. Let's go forward. Now, the Free Syrian Army. Let's bring you now up to date. The Free Syrian Army. If you look at the Nusra front, the Jabhat al-Nusra, you look at all the other subsets, you'll notice down at the bottom is ISIS or ISIL. They 
are a subset of a subset of a subset from the Free Syrian Army, which is a subset of the first Ikhwan that came. Why is this all important? Because the violence that we are seeing in our midst is the same violence go back to the 70s and the 80s in Egypt. Let's look at some of what's happened. In Iraq, Abdul Razak al Sa'adi was shot in the face in the masjid while delivering the khutbah. He was shot in the face. Sheikh Abdul Alim al Sa'adi was shot in the face while he was sitting in his car. Well, that shouldn't be surprising at all because when you go back to Egypt in the 1970s, Sheikh Muhammad Uthman al Dhahabi, the great alim from Egypt, was kidnapped by Ikhwan members from a subset called Jama'at al Takfir wal Hijra, Jama'at al Muslimin, decapitated, beheaded, and then disposed of. So, what you're seeing is nothing new. Anwar al Sadat's murder was facilitated by Ikhwan al Muslimin, particularly a subset. And Najun min nar those saved from the fire, which I couldn't fit on the graph. But all of the things that you're seeing go back to the 70s. And it's the exact same thing. People are trying to make the link when they're looking at the 11th of September and all the events before. But what you need to understand is all these subdivisions are going back to an original mother group. So what you are seeing in Iraq what you are seeing in Syria and on the borders of Turkey, it's something that is shocking, it's terrifying, but it's not something that hasn't happened before. That's what I want you to understand. Anyone who has read that book, Milestones by Sayyid Qutb, has been inspired to form one of these groups. Why? Because they for some reason feel that there is something wrong with the Muslims in their entirety and they need to do something about it to the point of even killing Muslims if it's necessary. You can see on the news most of the victims in Iraq and Syria are Muslims. They're not people who aren't Muslim which you would expect if it was a foreign invasion or an attack. Those people have been Muslims and it goes back to their theology. Please go forward. Sayyid Qutb's theology, which was laid out in the milestones, is a theology which spells disaster wherever it goes. Wherever you see this man appear, wherever you see his books appear, there's always fighting, there's always violence, there's always trials and tribulations. It doesn't matter where it goes, there's always fitna, tribulation. If someone does not know Arabic and they want to understand in detail the, all these interconnecting groups, I would advise that there was a program that was done called The Power of Nightmares. It's a three-part series. It was done by an Englishman. And when I watched that video, I said 90% of what's in here is totally accurate. The only reason why the 10% is there is because he doesn't know Arabic, so he couldn't quote some of the sources. But it's completely accurate. If you have a chance to see it, because you can't access the Arabic, it's an excellent summary of what I'm saying. Next point. Now, the first one to recognize what Sayyid Qutb did is when his book, Milestones, came into print. 1966. One of the big ulama, Muhammad Abdul Latif al Subki, who had already suffered assassination attempts, spoke against Sayyid Qutb's book. This is what I'm saying to you because sometimes the Muslims are told by people who are not Muslim. Where's the condemnation? Here it is right here. We said it when it first came out, when these books first appeared. We said, this is dangerous, it's explosive, it's got nothing to do with Islam, look out. Our only issue is we said it in Arabic and not English. Now it's here in English because some genius, I don't know who it was, some genius translated the milestones in English. Now if you've seen a book has done that much damage, that much destruction, and that many people who are co-religionists of you 
or are from your background have been murdered in cold blood, why would you translate that? Why would you translate it? So Muhammad Abdul Latif al Subki rightly classified this book for what it was, dangerous. Please move to the next slide. Now he says, in summing up, I would like to say that upon completion of my reading of Milestones, I have noticed two things. Firstly, the author is an overbearing and licentious man in his attitude. He looks at the world according to his dark fantasy and imagines it heading to the direction that he sees it or is evil as he imagines it. Secondly, Sayyid Qutb has used the name of Islam to excite the youth to what he believes is righteousness. The religious behavior includes rebellion against rulers and all of what comes with that, whether it be shedding blood, assassination plots against people, assassination plots against people, destroying buildings, spreading fear in the society, taking away public security and safety, fanning the flames of tribulation and all other forms of corruption in which no one knows how long it could be other than Allah the Exalted. Sounds familiar? Because that's what's happening right now. This was said in 1966, the first printing of the book. This is what I want you to understand. What's happening, although it's shocking, should not make you think that this is the first time this has happened. It's not. And the only thing that we can do about it from the vantage point where we're standing today is to assess it, to diagnose it, and to then reject it and have nothing to do with it. There are going to be social system changes. This is one of the most powerful ayat in the Quran. Let's move to his translation. Allah the Exalted says, Mankind, fear your Lord who created you from one soul and made it spouse from it. Then he spread out from that men and women in plentiful numbers. Fear Allah, whom you ask your mutual rights for regarding the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is watcher over you. Now, this is Surah Tunisa, the fourth Surah, Ayah 1. What's significant about this is this particular ayah gives us the following points. Number one, this particular ayah, if you go to most marriages that are done by Muslims, many times the Imam will recite this particular verse because it's a reminder of the importance of what marriage is for, which is what? Which is the fact that a soul comes together, men and women, they become one. The children that come from the inside of marriage, from a family. Number three, that the man is responsible for safeguarding and looking after his family. The next point is that the mother is responsible for safeguarding her section of the family and looking after it. And then also the only valid means with which a society can be kept running is through a good family. And without family, there's no society. This is why the Imams recite this particular ayah. If you have no marriage, you have no family. Without family and children, you have no society, this structure. Now let's move forward. Now the basis of family and society this verse sets up the basis of family and society. Faith is the bedrock of the marriage. Marriage is a sacrament and holy institution. So marriage is something that's good. It's a holy institution. It's a sacrament. By sacrament means it's something holy. It has worth. It's not just we go down to the registry office, we get the papers, and that's what we do. Marriage is a sacrament. It's holy. Let's go back get to that, please. Number three is man's authority is established over that of the woman. By authority, we mean in the sense of governing affairs. If he is the one that's responsible for the lion's share of bringing in the wealth, he must do this. He must do these things. He's responsible for looking after his family. The next point is children should only be produced within the marriage. And number five, family and society is more important than individual rights. That's extremely important. For the, sake of a, for the sake of family and society, people often have to give up individual, certain individual rights because society and family is more important than one individual. But in societies where that's turned on its head, 
and the individual is more important than the society, then that changes everything. Marriage and family establish and hold in place the building blocks of society. I've just given a schema of a building. And you'll notice the foundation is at the bottom and it's a strong portion of the building and it holds everything up. That's how we should look at the family and society. It's this strong foundation. It's holding everything together. If you lose the basic building blocks of your society, you no longer have a society. You have a collection of individuals. And a collection of individuals is fine. But have you ever seen a successful business or a company where everyone does what they want and there are no board meetings? No one agrees on a charter. No one agrees on when they'll meet. No one agrees on, any, on anything going forward for the business. And no one agrees on the profit margins or anything. Everyone's doing their own thing and the company's still a Fortune 500? That doesn't happen. Well, societies, there are certain Fortune 500 societies that we can point to in history. If we lose that, then you lose that societal aspect. When institutions such as marriage and family are undermined, society's undermined. Just like you see this building that's being brought down through a controlled demolition, if you do this to society, it's the same thing as doing a controlled demolition. You're tearing it down. Now, let's look at when you destroy the institution of faith and marriage in a society. I'm going to look at the country which I'm currently residing in. The United States is not an example of faith and marriage society because George Washington clearly in the preamble to his famous speech in Arlington said it wasn't a Christian country and that men are governed by their own conscience. So the United States is not a good example to use. This country is a good example to use because in this country we've been able to see the experiment of what happens when you remove faith and the basis of family as the bedrock of society. When you do this, we've been able to look at the transformation from 1530 onwards and see what happens. Faith is undermined by those in authority. The first one to undermine the faith, who was also the last absolute monarch of this country, was Henry VIII. He sought to get a divorce in order to marry to have a valid male heir for his kingdom. The church at that time, this country belonged to what's called the Roman Rite of the Universal Catholic Church of Jesus Christ. They would not grant the divorce because according to the book of Matthew, there are only two times a man may put away his wife, if she abandons the faith or abandons him, or adultery. So they would not grant the divorce. Henry VIII, in a move that no one could have foreseen in terms of human beings, moves himself away from the Roman rite of the, Catholic, the universal Catholic Church of Jesus Christ, moves away from that and creates what we now know today as the Anglican Church. Now he puts himself into a position in which, I'll be coming to this in just a moment, he puts himself into a position where he brings in the law of sovereignty where he declares that there is no higher head of the church than him. He's the head of the church. And that the act of sovereignty, he's taken full control. Then you have the treason act that came after that, which stated whoever doesn't accept the law of sovereignty is liable for the death penalty. So he's taking control of the faith, he's taking control of the religion. Now, after that time, divorces, obviously, because he set the precedent, start to increase. Marriage becomes something additional. You can go forward. Now, with the death of marriage, you then have the kiss of divorce. If you look at these statistics, you can see marriage nosediving and divorce going up. This is directly indicative of King Henry VIII's policy. Because if you change the social order, as he did, I'm not saying that divorce should never be allowed, but it's the way that he did it, by undermining the church. Because he renounced the church, he renounced the Pope, then he brought in his, his own people, and he declared his own archbishop, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury, he declared his own bishops. 
This man created his own form of Christianity, which made the people think what? Well, if religion becomes democratized, then all of us can do it. So I'm not for any moment saying that no one that's in a marriage that is devastating or, or painful or is undergoing any type of mental or physical torture should just stay and suffer. I'm saying the institution of marriage from what he did has not recovered. It's been undermined. Children outside of marriage, the increase. Now we've been able, because we've had a long time to research and keep records, the children that have come outside of marriage and that have come up in single parent households, mostly mothers, are the majority of the children that are suffering from delinquent behavior and are housed in the prison systems, in the bowels of the earth. And these children are that result, and they are suffering because the society is breaking down. Because now, individuals are asserting their rights. Individuals. So you have what are known as self-identified groups. In 1941, the word teenager was invented, and they created a social class of people called teenagers. Now we use the term with promiscuity because we assume that it's normal. Or oh, it must be his hormones raging because he's a teenager. Where did you get this from? We assume because the term was fed and now it's everywhere. The next term as we have is the bachelorette. This came in the 1970s. Then we have in the 1970s the tweenies. So these are the pre teenage people. Now, why are all these important? Here's how it's important. And I'll tie it together very quickly because I know my time is racing by. In the early part of the 16th century, England passed what was known as the Recovery Act. The Recovery Act took away land that people owned and abolished the trades. So people came from families of furriers, families of fishermen, families of, abolished the trades. Then after that came the Vagabond Act. The Vagabond Act took away properties that had been owned in people's families for generations. Then after that was an addendum to the Vagabond Act which stated anyone that's homeless wandering the streets without a job will be assumed to be a vagabond and is subject to arrest and being branded with a V. If he will not work the stipulated hours given to him, or if he runs away, he will be branded with an S or an R, slave or runner, and be in that condition for life. By taking away all of these things, undermining the society, taking away people's ability to look after themselves, you then create social groups the women were taken out of the house in the sense of not meaning they were behind closed doors and chained up. I'm talking about in the sense that they were taken out and made to work as many and as more and more hours than the men were. And you created unemployment among men. And then when jobs opened, you filled those jobs with women. So men became unemployed. They became dangerous. They became vagabonds. They became louts. They became jackabouts. They became saucy boys. All these different words they had for men that were unemployed because they filled the employment sur uh, surplus with women. Now the children, teenagers, why were there teenagers? Because you had to have a group to advertise to. Tweenies. There are magazines that are exclusively tweeny magazines. And they exploit the children. And the children then demand that their parents buy them this, these things, I want this, I want that. So they're moving the family away from its own unit and turning it into a consumerist model. So people are talking about, I have my rights as a child. I have my rights, women's rights, not society's rights. Child rights, not society's rights. These rights, that right. Everyone became a hyphenated generation. Everyone became Irish American, Puerto Rican American. There's no Americans left because everyone's been hyphenated. So who's running it? No one. Because everyone's taken their hand off the steering wheel. Individual as more important than the society. This is the most important woman 
in Western civilization in the middle part of the 20th century. This is Gloria Steinem. She was bankrolled by the CIA to help found Miss Magazine, and I've given some sources for that as well, and she admits this in her autobiography, to found what we know in its current form as the neo-feminist movement. The, suffra the suffrage movement, which actually called for women to be paid good rates the same as men were given, was co-opted by Gloria Steinem and transformed and metastinized and transmogrified into something else. And she was responsible for this transformation. She took big concepts about destroying family and how beneficial it would be for the society and shrunk them down very small and turned them into bite-sized pieces that are now digested wholesale without people even knowing it. Miss Magazine helped spread it far and wide. Now let's look at Earth's function as a barometer of the end. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that there will be three landslides. He mentions one in the east, one in the west, and one in Arabia, Khasaf, in Arabic means landslide, but khasaf also means sinkhole. If you look at these sinkholes that have been appearing, sinkholes often appear due to aggressive mining, flushing water out of underground water tables, which creates vacuums or voids, which causes the earth to drop down. You have deforestation leading to desertification. How are those related? Here's how. When you take water out of an area, or if you chop the trees down of a forest, you expose the soil. When it rains, when the trees were previously there, they would catch the rain. The soil would be trapped, and the soil would become rich, humus soil where you could grow crops on it. When you took the trees away, the water comes, the soil becomes mud and is washed away leaving thick clay that then dries in the sun. And it becomes so nitrogen rich, nothing will grow. There's, there's nitrogen rich soil, which is good for growing, but when it becomes clay and hard like brick, nothing will grow. Now this is an extreme example, but there are examples in Idaho and Oregon that I can take you to where it's just, it had never been desert and now it's desert. There's another extreme example. You can see the way this cliff is falling off from these trees. By taking those trees away, what used to hold things away from flooding? Sometimes you'll have an area that's in a valley. Trees will be at the top. They'll cut the trees down, and then the valley floods, and they can't understand why. Because by cutting down the trees, removing the soil, I, my background in terms of the secular sciences is geology. We came to a site once, this was in North Oregon. And we pleaded with this man, short of getting down on our knees and begging, not to build an apartment complex on sandstone because when it becomes wet, it becomes soft and porous like a sponge. He shook his head and nodded like a bobble and went on about his business. Three years later, he put it on there. We don't know who signed the contracts, who allowed it to be built. We're brought back out five years later. Can you guys explain what happened? A house while we were out there literally fell off one of the cliff faces. Our response was the explanation is quite simple. We'll make it very simple. Salt water is washing under the base of this shore. It's causing the sandstone to become soft and porous like sponge. It's puffing up and pushing everything out of the way. You know, like what we told you five years ago because people will go over the heads of the geologists and they treat us like we're palm readers or psychic hotline. To understand the world is very simple. As a geologist, a geologist's world is based in facts. If you build on granite and limestone, love to be with you. Build on sandstone, I'll see you in 10 years time underwater. You don't wanna build there. 
Old Basefer is not on sandstone, but it's in a thrush valley. So 2002, I was living in Noah's Ark because our area flooded. And they didn't bother to tell me that they re-diverted the river. So these are the realities that are caused. Then you have desertification. The Sahara Desert is expanding in size. Now the Sahara Desert is only 4,000 years old, but it's expanding in size because equatorial African nations and nations under there are doing massive uh, tree burning exercises to clear land for new apartment blocks, new buildings, new developments. And by doing that, the soil's being washed away, desertification, famines, and people are, some people, not everyone, some people laugh when they see starving Ethiopians on television because they're saying they're so skinny, why are they still living there? Well, it wasn't like that 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But when you cut down all those trees, you cut down the date palms, you cut down the banana trees, you cut down all the trees and you leave the soil which gets washed away in the rainy season, it changes the weather and it transforms everything completely. Very quickly, I'll mention this. Nasser, Gemal Abdul Nasser, who came to power in 1952 or 53 in Egypt, was part of the reason why I'm standing here talking to you today. When he brought in his communist reforms, he decided he was going to make Egypt just like Stalinist Russia. So he built the Eswan High Dam and he changed the weather in the area. He couldn't understand why the Nile stopped flooding, why it started drying up, and why it was raining in places it never rained in, and why it, started, it stopped raining in places that it used to rain in, why trees died, why it wilted, why the soil lost nitrogen account. He couldn't understand what had happened, even though geologists had told him a year ago before they were killed not to do it. So what I'm telling you are things that you can see in your actual world around you. Now, how does this impact us? Some of you might remember that one of, the, one of the sandstorms from the Sahara Desert blew sand here. It actually got here. And that's a proof that the Sahara Desert is growing not just in size, but in its influence. Now that's just a little bit, that was a small taste. Could you imagine if several more tons of sand made its way here? We could have been covered in a sandstorm. And these are coming about because we are not paying attention that things we do 5,000 miles away or 4,000 miles away or 3,000 miles away have an impact on somewhere else. Flooding. The moment you cut down trees in an area and it's not replaced, when that soil washes away, the water has to go somewhere when it rains. The trees and soil and rocks that used to catch that water are no longer there to hold it back. So what happens? Rivers flood their banks. Waters, are blow, water, waters blow, blow past their water levels. Now when it gets too, when the water becomes too high, the water either becomes a small level tsunami or what do you do? You detonate the dikes. This is what happened in the, in the flood in Katrina in the southeast of the United States. The water level became so under pressure, they thought if we don't do something, it's gonna become a small, little, small level tsunami. Well, what do we do? We'll detonate the dikes, we'll blow the dikes. When they blew the dikes, it flooded and killed a whole bunch of people that were near the bottom of Louisiana. But it saved the upscale homes that were further up, which is what you really wanna do. This is the attitude. So you have to understand these things are happening for a reason. All of what you see that's happening around us is are, are all of what you're seeing, they're things that we haven't seen before. And if we have seen them, they've not happened on the same level as they've happened before. Now, the end of currency. I've put up a slide here to give you an example the very first fractional banks opened in the year 1600. Fractional banking, I'm talking about central banks as you and I know them, which started collecting people's money and giving them pieces of paper as promissory notes, lending the money back out, 
and as it sounds like a crazy thing to say, but they first started in Norway. There's a scholar from the Ottomans who did a very, very fantastic job because he went to Norway, he went to Denmark, and he studied their systems because he said a time may come where they attempt to impose these systems on us so we have to understand what's happening. So there begin to be disputes about central banking and fractional banking coming into the Muslim world. And he did an, a brilliant study. This is actually 11 pages. I've only translated the first three. Just takes the top right off of your head. It's so mind blowing. Fractional banking is the beginning. This is an example in 1900 of the Bank of America. And this was the accelerated process of fractional banking. Now, things then move to stock markets. Now you'll see on the picture here, the stock market to start with, starts with people. But then it starts to go digital. People start to handle money digitally. Now, there's no one there, except for people to man the computers. So who's trading? The computers are. No people are trading on the stock market. Everything is being done according to logarithmic functions. Now eventually, logarithmic functions and exponential equations hit a brick wall. So what's gonna happen eventually? Well, eventually what's gonna happen is the computers are gonna hit some type of exponential wall and the computers are all gonna read out no sale. When that happens, then everything will go down. Now, where we're gonna be when that happens, I don't know. I plan on being out of the way. Because when that happens, that will change everything that we understand about currency. Now, some people got it in their mind, well, why don't we then digitize the currency so when this happens, we have a fail-safe device in place? So, they decide to bring the currency and go electronic and do Bitcoin mining. But the problem with this is, who controls the Bitcoin mining? Well, the same people who have the servers. Who are the people that have the servers? Their response is, none of your business. But do you want to use this product? So you're looking here, this is an example of the keys to make the Bitcoin mining and you buy a portion of these Bitcoins which are electronic in nature and then you can save them and they're worth a great deal, then you can sell them off. But you don't know when they could be reclaimed. You don't know when someone could ask for it back. You don't know who owns the servers that are controlling this massive edifice. You don't know. Then you have Google Glass makes money even safer. But for who? Now you have people that can trade using Google Glass. They just have something going over the glasses and they do all their transactions. But something's going to happen, whether it's staged or not, but something's going to happen in which they'll say, not even that's safe. Because if someone can watch the transaction that you're making on your glasses and take your glasses, then they can carry out your transactions for you. So then what's safer? Oh, what's safer is one of these. Now this sounds crazy, but death row prisoners in the United States are already fitted with these chips which are the size of a grain of rice. Now, by a grain of rice, I mean the long grain basmati, not the short Jamaican or the Egyptian. So it's long, <laughs> goes under the skin, and that's where it fits. It's been for people who wander off. Pets, animals, children. There are children in Chicago that the parents are like, we can't keep track of the little fellas, so we'll just put it under the arm. There was one man that made a statement he was a hiker in the United States, and he was also a doctor by trade. He said something, I want you to hear this out. He said, if I fall down and I'm unresponsive and unconscious, and doctors find me and they scan my arm or my right hand or my head, and they are able to ascertain my medical history and to treat me, that takes more precedence over any of my personal privacy. That's the reality of what he said. And there are many people that would say, well, that makes sense. I mean, if we get hurt, other things. But the question you have to ask is, who's controlling this information and how's it being helped? Don't you remember this massive issue with the iClouds? 
Now let's just forget for a second that there are a large amount of people taking pictures of themselves naked on their phone. Let's just forget that for a second. The fact of the matter is, there are people that have access to all of this. When you send an email and it doesn't go through, it comes back as mailer daemon if you have Yahoo. Mailer daemon, email was not able to be sent to the address. Why? Because whenever you send a mail through, it has to go through a go-between. That go-between is mailer daemon. So everything's going through these third parties. If you don't control the third parties, and if you don't know who the third party groups are, you have to be extremely careful what you send. Because sometimes we think that what we're sending is just going through the air and there's nobody else that's looking at it. But it has to have a third party in order for it to reach its destination. That's where all these servers and such come in at. Solutions. Here are my solutions. My advice is number one, to learn a trade of some sort. Teaching, electrician, carpenter, anything like that where you can really look after yourself. Because I think by doing these trades, you always guarantee yourself, no matter what condition the society is in, that you will be able to obtain some type of wealth. If you put your in situa yourself in a situation where you don't have an essential trade, if people take control of the currency or the supply, and they put you in a situation that you don't want to be put in, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to learn some type of trade in which you can barter with those skills that you have on some type of agreed on transaction because a time will come where you may need to do so. Number two, post mesjidism You have post-modernism. I'm referring to post mesjidism A time is coming in which these big mega mesjids that are being built are not going to be safe to attend and go to. Many of them are already targets now for racist violence and other things. In the future, it's going to be more dangerous, which is precisely why I support gatherings like this, smaller, more tightly knit, and the focus groups that you want are present. As things go on in the press and in the news, I believe that many of these messages will be seized or foreclosed upon or taken control of by the wider government because they're going to feel they're not doing enough or what have you. You then need to think of an alternative to build either smaller messages, smaller places of worship, smaller gathering places, because what we understand now is going away. This current reality is going away. Number three, close knit communities and good neighbors. You need to keep your family close to you, whatever form it's in, good or bad, and get to know your neighbors and the people around you. Find out who has a farm. Find out who sells fresh fruit and fresh veg. Find out. Give them a try before going to a big conglomerate. Give them a try. Number four, accessing solid commodities. So when you access solid commodities, whether it's in the form of a, 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 a house or whether it's in the form of gold or silver or copper or something like this, make sure that you have access to solid commodities. Try to get away from putting yourself in a situation where you're renting everything or renting to buy because eventually they will come back. I'll give you one example of this. There is an organization, I'm not sure if it's here, it's in the United States, it's called Rent-A-Center and they rent you appliances. So you can rent a stove, a washer, a dryer, a heater, all these different things. But in the bottom, there's a stipulation that reads, at any one time, even if the customer is up to date with payments, rent a center may reclaim their products without prior notice and obtain a right of entry into the said location where the items are stored. Well, you can imagine my surprise, I'm sitting at a friend of mine's house, and the door comes flying off. And guys are wearing Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms jackets, and I've got a 30-odd six pointed at my head, and I'm being told to lay down on the ground because they want the washer back? 
So my response is, well, Maytag's not that good anyway. But the point of the matter is, they took the stove, they took the washer, they took the dryer. And we were left with a paper like this to read the small print, which was like font five. And I have astigmatism and I'm nearsighted. So this is the situation. Make sure you don't put yourself in this situation. Number five, self-sufficient energy. Start looking at other options. What can I do? Number six, self-sufficient utilities. Start to think about other options. In the south of England, there are more people sinking wells and building wells. People have resorted to getting a hold of distilled water and doing more things like this to get cleaner water. And then number seven, food supply. There is no reason in this country to not have the best food possible. In the United States, when you walk into a shopping market or a shopping mall or, or any type of grocery store, it's like a science fiction for You have chocolate that's made in a laboratory, candy bars, product of S&S &S laboratories. What? Here, that's not yet here fully. You still have an option. You can buy raw milk where it's not against the law, where they raid your house. You can still buy fresh fruit and vegetables. What are you doing growing these? You can still grow them. You can still catch rainwater and distill it and do things. In the United States, you catch rainwater, you're arrested. Why? Because the United States government, when you buy the house, they clearly state at the bottom, in the footnotes, that all matters to do with the house on, in, or around it are the property of the United States government. That includes your rainwater. So you go to three, three years in jail, a supermax prison, there's guys in there for killing police and everything else. What are you in for? I caught my rainwater man. <laughs> These are the things. So my advice to you is this. Really start to think about what it is that you have. Come together. And instead of thinking about mega projects, shrink it down and start thinking about your family. The one that's sitting next to you the one that lives next door to you and get to know those people because I have a feeling that you and those people are going to need each other for the future.